Great. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Upal. I'm serving as the chair of IEEE Computer Society San Diego chapter this year. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone uh, to the first talk of this invited seminar series organized by our chapter. Today's talk is co-sponsored by IEEE Information T Technology Society and Computational Intelligence Society. Uh, both society chairs are present here, Michelle and Doug. Uh, uh, IEEE being the world's largest technical professional organization is dedicated to advancing technology for the benefits of humanity. As part of this global effort, IEEE San Diego section is regularly organizing a wide range of activities and events. For information about the upcoming events, please visit the IEEE San Diego section website. Uh, we'll share the uh, link in the chat. Uh, the IEEE Computer Society is dedicated to engaging engineers, scientists, academicians, and industry professionals for global technical advancement in all areas of computing. This seminar series is an effort to enable knowledge sharing and increase networking among our members as well as interested non-members. It is our immense pleasure to have Professor Srijan Kumar as our first invited speaker. Uh, Dr. Kumar is an assistant professor at uh, College of Computing at Georgia Institute of Technology. Uh, he did his postdoctoral training at Stanford and his doctoral research at the University of Maryland College Park. He and his research group innovates efficient methods for detection, prediction, and mitigation of uh, online threats and content such as malicious actors, misinformation, hate speech, and fake reviews. Dr. Kumar's solutions has, have been used at Flipkart, which is India's largest e-commerce platform, now acquired by Walmart, it has influenced Twitter's Bardwatch platform, uh, and is now being deployed on Wikipedia. He has been recognized as a Kavli Fellow by the National Academy of Sciences and a Forbes 30 under 30. He is also a CRA Computing Innovation Mentor, Facebook Faculty Research Awardee, and Adobe Faculty Research Awardee. His work has been covered in a documentary titled Familiar Shapes on Apple Podcast, uh, in radio interviews, and by popular press, including Wired, CNN, Wall Street Journal, and many more. In today's talk, Dr. Kumar will give us an idea about advancements in NLP and ML-based approaches for fighting digital misinformation and malicious users. Without further ado, Srijan, the floor is yours. Thank you for inviting me. It's my uh, utmost pleasure to be here and share some of the work my students and I have done over the past several years at Georgia Tech to improve the safety and integrity and well-being of users, communities, and platforms online. This is a super important topic because fraudsters, bad actors, online misinformation and polarization presently create one of the biggest threats today to public health, democracy, science, and the entire society. And the problem is huge. Facebook estimates around 5% of its accounts are whopping 40, 145 million accounts to be fake. And it's estimated that Amazon has around 300 million fake reviews. And of course, everyone knows about the immense impact that online misinformation has had uh, in the topics of, uh, of uh, broadly in the recent times of COVID vaccine misinformation and the threats uh, and the resulting harassment and assault of, uh, of Asians that have resulted because of online misinformation uh, against them. Such harmful content typically disproportionately disproportionately impacts marginalized and disadvantaged communities. And the problem is particularly alarming today, uh, and we need to solve it uh, now. Today, people spend 20% of our time online, and we get more news and information from our friends and family in social media than, on traditional news, than from traditional news organizations. As a result, it has become immensely easy for online bad actors and dangerous online content to manipulate public opinions against even the best available evidence. So distrust against experts and uh, turn people against democratic processes. Notably, due to the very recent advancements in generative AI, everyone's familiar with ChatGPT and DALI and others, it has become the cost of bad actors to create very believable misinformation that's even 
quote unquote, backed by scientific evidence, including texts and images and videos, it has become so easy for bad actors to create and use them for harmful purposes that if we don't do anything now, the problem will get even bigger going forward. Today, we are at a crossroads uh, where the fabric, the entire fabric of society uh, is being threatened by such bad actors. Therefore, at Georgia Tech, my students and I build AI, machine learning, and data mining methods to combat such online harms and improve the integrity, improve platform integrity, user equity, and community well being using uh, online social media data. We innovate natural language processing, graph neural networks, and behavior modeling techniques to develop what we call multi X detection methods. Essentially, multi-X stands for multi-platform, multilingual, and multimodal, which means our models are not focused on the typically studied English language text from Twitter, but we look at data that spans multiple platforms that go beyond English and uh, spread harm using text, images, and videos. So we develop state-of-the-art models to detect them. But more importantly, in the domains of web safety and integrity, while we are trying to catch the bad actors, the bad actors are trying to fool and evade the detection systems. They continuously evolve their strategies to fool, uh, to fool us so that they can continue to make, uh, make their harms go far and wide. Therefore, we are one of the first groups to develop adversarial machine learning methods to identify the vulnerabilities that current detection systems have and create the next generation of systems that are not only accurate, but also robust against adversarial harms. We also create methods to attribute the role that such online harms have in the real world. And finally, and most importantly, we create data-driven solutions as well as tools to mitigate such online harms and enhance uh, the, the safety, equity, and well-being that online platforms create. As Upal said, uh, some of our work has been deployed at Flipkart, has influenced Twitter, and is now being deployed at Wikipedia. We are also creating new tools that empower ordinary users um, to correct misinformation. And uh, we have a big NSF grant uh, to build what we call Course Correct, which will enable professional fact checkers and journalists to be very efficient in monitoring as well as delivering misinformation corrections in real time. I'll talk about this uh, in the later half of the talk. I'll first cover detection. I'll briefly touch on robustness, and then I will, I will end the talk by talking about some of our mitigation solutions. And at any point in time, please feel free to stop me. Just unmute yourself and ask any question that you might have, or you can put that on chat. And uh, if Upul can, uh, can convey the question to me, that would be, that would be great. Sure. Thank you. So let's start with detection. The most studied data online is English language text from Twitter. However, and, and by the way, the reason is because it's super easy, or at least it has been easy until very recently to collect such data and, and uh, analyze that. Now with upcoming changes to Twitter and its APIs, we don't know what's, uh, what's going to happen. But uh, so far, uh, English language text from Twitter is the most studied online data, at least in research. However, it turns out that 74% of data is actually not in English. Uh, in fact, and misinformation is a problem that, that's, that's language agnostic. You, you get misinformation in any language. It doesn't just use text, and it definitely spreads across social platforms. Uh, therefore, we started a line of work where we, where we looked at uh, the impact that misinformation has across multiple platforms, how it spreads. And in this particular work, which was at uh, AAAI ICWSM 2022, we looked at the dispar uh, at potential disparity that might be present in English versus non-English models that are created. Specifically, 
Since we researchers uh, spend most of our time creating the latest and greatest um, English language models and classifiers, we were curious to understand how non-English classifiers stack up against these English language classifiers. Uh, and whether if there is any disparity, whether there's any solution that can be created. So let me be more specific. We consider the case where you have multimodal data, where you have images and text, and the text is written in English. And we consider three different scenarios uh, detecting crisis, hum uh, crisis humanita humanitarian tasks, which is about uh, detecting when a, when a crisis happens, just like what's happening in Turkey right now um, because of the earthquake, what, uh, what are people saying about it in terms of whether they're reporting damage, whether they're reporting about uh, volunteering or uh, rescue efforts or donation efforts uh, or talking about something else. We also have tasks on fake news detection and emotion detection. And in each of these tasks, we have, Eng uh, we have text and English language, uh, we have English language text and accompanying image. What we wanted to investigate was that if the same misinformation, if the same content is spreading in another language, will machine learning models be able to identify that misinformation as effectively as effectively as it would if it's spreading in English. So what we did was actually we created translations of this English language misinformation, English language crisis tasks, and English language emotional appeal uh, content to five other languages. So we hired translators to do that. And we also used verified automated translators. Uh, we created data sets that are super large and translated English language content into Spanish, Portuguese, Chinese, Hindi, and one more language, uh, French. And what we found was that if you take the best English language to detect uh, misinformation, and you take the best non-English language in each of these individual languages, and try to identify the misinformation in that specific language, the non-English language models do not perform as well. So the F1 score for this classification task for English is 0.65. And you see this decreasing trend as you go from left to right across different language. Essentially, this highlights that even, even though the same misinformation content is being spread in the other language, the automated classifiers are not able to identify that as effectively. Now you can imagine the harm that this can have, specifically on marginalized communities that do not speak English uh, and which are often targets of online misinformation, hate, harassment, and other societal harms. And what is, this is showing is that as these as platforms are developing AI models, text-based AI models to identify online harms in English and in other languages, because of this disparity, the English speaking population is better served than the non-English language population. This disparity, we tested, as, as I said, we tested this disparity uh, on multiple different data sets and we consistently see such a trend. So then we looked at how we can create solutions, how we can improve uh, over this. And what we did was, uh, we, we, we realized that in many of these scenarios, we also have images. So we created late fusion-based multimodal models that, uh, that extract information from the text as well as from the image, combine them together and use that for classification. And to our, uh, to, to our pleasant surprise, what we found was that there was improvement across the board, but using images helped improve English language content by 5% while it helped improve non-English language content classification by around 11.5% on average. Essentially showing that uh, this disparity is, is bridged in a way where, uh, where English language is improved, but non-English is improved more, and the gap between English and non-English uh, reduces. This was one of our solutions that we created, and uh, this was 
We are hoping that others would take this forward and come up with other solutions to help bridge multilingual disparity uh, in, in the task. At the same time, um, so this is this is work that we presented as ICWSN 2022, and we did realize that language alone is not sufficient to help solve these problems. So what we did was we created language agnostic models, specifically by using interaction data. So when people interact online, when they do anything online, they leave these digital traces of who is connecting with whom, who is talking to whom, who uh, and how, uh, who, who is uh, commenting on what post and so on. So uh, what we did was we created these networks out of uh, out of such interactions. So these networks represent users and content, and which user is interacting with what content at what time. And these interactions can be uh, writing a post, liking it, commenting on it, resharing, and so on. And we created a model, which which I'll describe, uh, uh, which I'll, I'll talk about in a bit. We created a model called Jody, which uh, takes such interaction, temporal interaction networks and creates dynamic embedding trajectories. So these dynamic embedding trajectories, what they are is a vector representation of every user and of every piece of content that evolves. And this vector representation or embedding evolves over time. And since this, uh, since this trajectory is evolving over time, we are able to understand not just what the historical properties of the user or the content was, we can also use these trajectories to forecast what will happen in the future. So using these trajectories, we can make several types of inferences. And the specific model that we created is called Jody. Uh, it takes this, this interaction embedding and it's a the model is a graph neural network based model that takes uh, that that is a recurrent neural net uh, that takes is a system of recurrent neural network frameworks that updates embeddings from previous timestamp to the current timestamp and it uses a kalman filter approach uh, or kalman's filter inspired approach to forecast embeddings in into the future using this uh, and using these embedding trajectories, we were able to show that uh, Jody model is able to outperform several existing state-of-the-art malicious user detection models to uh, in the task of detecting bad actors on multiple data sets uh, that we collected from the real world. In fact, Jody outperformed existing baselines but by about 12%. And if someone's interested in checking it out, we have all the code and data available on this website. What was very satisfying and very, uh, very, very fulfilling for us was that shortly after we created this model in 2019, uh, Facebook created a model in 2020 that is a follow-up work on this, uh, on this work. Uh, our model is called Joint Dynamic Interaction Embedding. Facebook followed it up with uh, temporal interaction embeddings, their model is called ties. And they use this model, uh, the ties model, currently in production, to identify various different types of online harms, including identifying ad payment fraud, uh, misinformation content, and, uh, um, and I think bot accounts. Uh, and shortly thereafter, Twitter uh, came up with its own generalized model which generalizes ties and Jody and several other models. And you and it uses that uh, to create, uh, to identify bad actors on their platform. What this is showing is that such graph-based models have a lot of potential to scale even to platform, super large platform scale data uh, with certain optimizations that can be done and have a potential to solve real world, uh, to identify bad actors not just from the content, uh, but also from the interactions that they have. So uh, let me pause here and uh, take any questions that you might have about, about the multilingual disparity work 
or about uh, this graph based approach that we have created. Um, good evening, Professor. Uh, am I audible? Uh, yes. Uh, so, Professor, uh, and in case of uh, different languages other than uh, English, it's pretty common that we use mix up of languages. So, like while we type something, it's very common that we mix up languages. So, how does this common when the languages are like? Sure, great question. So the question I'll repeat it because your voice was not very clear. Uh, the question was. Uh, people typically on social media, uh, they mix languages. So they would start writing in English and then they would switch to, let's say, Hindi, and then they would switch back to, to, to English. Uh, that's called code switching. Uh, and, uh, and, and that is a well-studied uh, topic in, in natural language processing. In this work, we specifically looked at complete translation. So completely, uh, the, the content is entirely in English or in one of the other languages. Um, so I can't really say what the exact numbers are going to be, but since we saw an improvement in all individual languages, I, um, uh, my, my intuition would say that even if the content is code switched, it's a mix of multiple language, we'd still see improvements by using multimodality. And we would also see disparity, uh, which was our one of our key observations. So I'm uh, yeah, the, the work would, uh, I, I expect the work to hold, we haven't done experiments, but that would be actually a very good follow up uh, for a general version of the paper. Uh, hi, I have a quick question. When you, uh, uh, do, do you have a single model that actually can handle all of these languages or you have to retrain? Great question. So we did experiments with monolingual models as well as multilingual models. Monolingual models are the best models that have been, we took the best possible models at the time we did the experiments for each of these individual languages, uh, as well as we did experiments where we, did, where we took the best multilingual model, which works on multiple different languages. And uh, the paper has all the details, but we, but we still see this disparity and we still see improvement uh, when using multimodal data uh, augmentation for uh, to bridge the disparity. Okay, yeah, thanks. Okay, uh, I'll go ahead and again, feel free to stop me at any point in time. So continuing on the line of uh, line of research that we have built in terms of Det uh, in terms of uh, building detection models. Uh, very recently, just last year, we, we did one of the first works on detecting ban evasion. So one of the biggest challenges that we have today uh, that face platform integrity solutions is that as soon as you deploy a model to detect bad actors uh, and, it, and the model catches bad actors, it's trivial. It's literally trivial for bad actors to just create new accounts and continue their malicious activities. Um, and in many cases, we have all we have even seen people creating 15 different accounts to spread out their malicious activities across these different accounts. So in a work that was led by my PhD students, uh, PhD student Gaurav Verma and an undergrad at the time, Manoj Navarthi, uh, we conducted one of the first studies to look at the problem of pan evasion uh, where our goal was to study how bad actors create new accounts after being banned and whether we can create detection and prediction models, uh, whether we can create detection models to identify when such evasion has happened and even predictive models to predict which bad actor will evade a ban in the future. Uh, by taking, uh, by, by creating models, by we first created uh, one of the first data sets of ban evasion uh, with identified ground truth from Wikipedia. And then we created machine learning models that look at linguistic network as well as behavioral properties. And we were able to create detection models for ban evasion that have very high performance at 0 0.9 area under the ROC code. 
uh, we told this to Wikipedia moderators, essentially people, volunteers on Wikipedia who currently uh, do platform integrity tasks pretty much manually. And they got super excited about this result. And they asked us to create a tool for them. So right now we are in the process uh, of creating a tool where the moderators don't have to do all this manual work, but can use the use our predictive models to not only um, know which account is potentially ban evasion, ev evasion account, but also explore that further along with uh, along with additional information in terms of uh, in, in terms of explaining why our model is saying uh, whether two accounts is uh, are are, um, are related or not or ban evasion or not we have delivered the first uh, version of the tool to moderators they were super excited about it they gave us a lot of very useful feedback so we are now uh, incorporating this feedback and we expect that the model uh, that the updated version of the tool will be delivered to them in a, a by the end of the semester So, so far I've explained, uh, uh, I've, I've talked about a few models that we have built to identify bad actors and harmful content online. Uh, and while we are creating these models and while some of these models are being deployed, we are very cognizant of the fact that shortly after some of these models will be deployed, they will become useless. And the reason is not because the models are not good. The reason is that the bad actors will change their behavior. They will adapt how they behave, how they write, who they connect with, and various other properties of their own behavior. And they will change that in order to evade detection. And they will also try to manipulate, uh, manipulate other accounts. And this is something that the trust and safety professionals and platform integrity solution developers uh, are very well aware of, but struggle with immensely because there's no way currently uh, to, to deal with this. So what we did was we, uh, we, we, has, we started a line of research in my group uh, where we try to understand what the vulnerabilities of these detection models are and we try to do that in advance before these models are deployed so that we can identify these vulnerabilities, patch them and uh, in, in such a way that the bad actors are not able to leverage these vulnerabilities for their, uh, for their harm. The goal, my vision for this line of work is to create models that are not just accurate, but also robust against adversarial manipulation. So along those lines, uh, with that mission, we uh, we conducted one of the very first works of adversarial machine learning, of what I call practical adversarial machine learning against such uh, detection systems to identify how robust they are against adversarial manipulation. And this work was led by my PhD student, Bing Hei, and, uh, and was funded by a Facebook faculty award to my group. The solution that we came up with was to create robustness evaluation as well as benchmarking system uh, where we were able to create systems that would be able to identify the robustness of dete existing detection systems, benchmark them and, uh, and, and test how they would perform if an adversary was specifically trying to break the model in a white box or a black box setting. We created one specific adversarial attack in the paper. We call it PetGen. So let's look into that. So the current way in which uh, many of the detection systems work is that they take, if they try to do bad actor detection, they would represent a user as a C, as, as, a C, uh, as the sequence of posts that they have created. So let's say this lady, uh, um, is uh, is a malicious user and she has posted about movie, soccer, and a couple of restaurants on their on, on their social media feed. And these can be posts, these can be likes, these can be any sort of interactions. And when uh, the platform's bad actor detection model 
takes this sequence of interactions into as as input it detects that this user is malicious but what we did was we said if we act as bad actors if we act as these malicious users can we write a post can we augment the data with a post in such a way that after this attack when this and when this new representation new sequence that represents the user is taken as input by the detection model it misclassifies the uh, the user not as malicious but as benign which would mean that the attacker is successful in fooling the detection model uh, by by diluting by adding a post or by diluting or distracting the model uh, and and being detect be classified as a benign user rather than a malicious user so we said what sort of post should the bad actor write and to do that we created um, the model called petgen which stands for personalized text generator and it's a multi stage multi task learning framework that takes into account the historical posts that the user has written or interacted with the context of those posts a target context and uses all of that information to match the style of the user uh, make a post relevant uh, both with respect to the recent post that the attacker has made as well as the target specific uh, discussion that the entire platform is having to create a a a, a attack post which when augmented will lead uh, the the will lead to the detection model being fooled we did many experiments both on facebook's own uh, model as well as uh, uh, in in a bench uh, in a sandbox setting uh, as well as various other uh, various other detection models that are state of art and what we found very surprisingly was that facebook's ties system uh, which is which is the one that's deployed uh, on their platform can be fooled very easily one out of four times by their det uh, by this very simplistic uh, attack this is huge because it's showing that these model this this specific model has a 25% failure rate which if you are from cybersecurity is unthinkable because uh, because you would want a failure rate to be 0.0001 but this model even though it's in production has a failure rate of uh, 25% and it's not the model developers faults even because uh, because there is no way in which one could reliably test how robust these systems are and even these simple attacks are able to fool them so to bridge to bridge this gap uh, we are in the process of creating these benchmarking systems where any bad actor detection system any misinformation detection system can be identified uh, can be benchmarked against various different types of adversarial as well as non adversarial attacks so that we can uh, so that we can create systems we can make it a habit not just to test for accuracy but also for also to test for robustness uh, in in a way that uh, that existing uh, system uh, in a way that would lead to the creation of next generation of uh, systems that are robust as well we also have conducted other works that was published at uh, cikm uh, last year at emnlp uh, 2022 as well as couple of other submissions at acl this year where we have looked at the robustness of recommender systems uh, multimodal detection systems as well as uh, as well as uh, text based models and it, across the board what we have found is that while deep learning models are being developed to detect uh to to detect various different uh, types of online harms and to uh, and being used for critical uh, critical tasks they really are not very very robust uh, we need uh, we, we we have highlighted the need to create systems to improve the robustness and that's an active very active area of research in my group 
let me again pause and take any questions that you might have about robustness uh, part of the work that uh, that I just uh, talked about. Uh, Professor, I have a question. So um, in many cases, the bad actors uh, do not use typical word to, you know, put bad comments. Uh, it's sometimes slang or uh, grammatically not so correct uh, or spelling mistake stuff. Uh, so how does the system, you know, work for those? Because as far as I understand, language models generally are trained for correctly spelled words or something which is, you know, messed up. Yeah, great point. That's that's another um, and that is another way in which bad actors are trying to fool these detection systems. In fact, uh, misspellings or uh, um, uh, what we would uh, so. In fact, uh, this in the course that I taught previous semester in in fall twenty twenty two, one of the course projects uh, students came up with was to look into that. They, they essentially uh, looked at uh, at this at how people are trying to fool TikTok's moderation system by changing certain characters uh, in 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 uh, in banned words and uh, replacing certain words with certain other words and uh, the, uh, and what they were able to find is in fact around fifteen to twenty percent uh, cases they were able to identify harmful content or uh, or policy violating content where people are uh, are, are mis using misspellings uh, to uh, to to evade this type of uh, of of moderation uh, current detection systems are not aware of those because they are not trained to identify such harms and that again that is something uh, that some of the benchmarks that we are trying to build uh, would help solve uh, would definitely help solve Uh, hi, Professor. I had a question. Uh, I was wondering, how did you get your ground truth labels for malignant or benign uh, class of, of, as for the classification classification system? And I was also curious, how did you uh, how did you get to know that this should be classified as a benign or malignant while training? So as a source truth. So yeah. Great, great question. Uh, so we have uh, we have used existing data sets that others have created where they have provided ground truth, uh, and we have also crawled our own data set uh, where we have used public data set from Wikipedia, uh, where moderators have identified uh, manually identified which accounts are malicious and banned them from the platform, along with given given along with uh, certain reasons. So, for example, yeah, so in, in Jody work, we created two new data sets and we released them publicly. One is from Reddit, uh, where we had 10,000 users out of which 366 were malicious. And this ground truth was given to us, uh, was, was given to us and it was verified. These accounts were in fact banned on the platform uh, and on Wikipedia moderators banned 217 accounts out of 8200 uh, accounts so we use these data sets along with other data sets that uh, that others have created uh, there are popular data sets uh, about uh, bots on twitter uh, that uh, that can be used there are several other data sets uh, that that are present uh, we have we have if you are interested we have curated a list of such uh, bad actor, harmful content data sets uh, in my group, and we have made those available for further research, uh, and they can be found on my website. So we never make decision of who is bad and who is not, or what's misinformation or what's not. We always rely on experts. We always rely on ground truth that's, that we can verifiably get from, from either the platform themselves or from certain experts. Right, thank you. Um, I have a question. So yeah. um, I was wondering, uh, you've talked about uh, methods for detecting co uh, bad content as well as methods for detecting bad users. And I'm wondering how these methods sort of compare against each other in terms of just like 
effectiveness in general um, for, for the platform uh, safety. Great point. Um, yeah, so we have developed harmful content detection and harmful user detection models, and they are complementary. Um, they work they, they work and feed off each other uh, in the sense that this Jody model that's there, uh, it uses, it, it, it can be used to do bad actor detection from this side of the, of the graph, but it can be used to do bad content detection from the right-hand side of the graph. And in fact, uh, Ties, which is Facebook's follow-up work to Jody, uses both sides of the graph to detect ad payment fraud, how, um, uh, bot accounts, as well as misinformation content posts. Uh, so these can be used up from both sides. Some of the other works, such as the multimodal uh, work or uh, that I've talked about, uh, those works are content-based primarily, and uh, they can be used in augmentation with, uh, with user-centric uh, models that we have. Any other questions? All right, I'll go ahead. Uh, so, so far I've talked about a few detection models that we have created and some of the work around robustness of these detection models. Uh, I don't have time to talk about attribution, but uh, in a scientific reports paper that we published last year, we looked at attributing the harm that online misinformation has on uh, on mental health and anxiety and what we showed was uh, there is a uh, a causal impact on consuming misinformation and believing in misinformation and exacerbation of of anxiety and uh, there's disparity in there as well with respect to uh, who's more educated and who's less less educated We've also, we, we have also started some other work um, recently funded by CDC to look at uh, the impact of online misinformation, specifically uh, anti-violence uh, provoking misinformation and attributing that, uh, attributing the impact of that to, uh, to violence provoking intentions on the consumers of such misinformation. In the sense uh, that if you read a misinformation that is hateful against Asians, uh, do you as a reader become more likely to either uh, harass Asians online or in the physical world? Uh, that's something that we, uh, that's a project that we, uh, that was uh, started last year and we are in the process of, uh, of, uh, of, of working, uh, of doing the research on that. Uh, and we have also started a lot of work. We have also done a lot of work on mitigation solutions. So let me talk a bit about that. So given that there's so much, uh, so, so much online harm uh, that's there, uh, to find solutions, we in, in a couple of NSF funded projects, we analyzed uh, online misinformation spreading during COVID-19. Um, so I joined Georgia Tech in January, 2020. And in March, everything went online because of the pandemic. I, I just moved to Atlanta. I was still figuring out where's, where's good coffee, where's good Indian food and so on. And while there was a lot of chaos in the real world, there's a whole other storm brewing in the online social media world. And that storm was about COVID misinformation. Uh, one of my favorite uh, or funniest misinformation that I find is that uh, COVID vaccines have microchips in it that can track every movement that you have and that you do. Uh, and therefore you should not take COVID vaccines. Uh, that's not true. There's no, uh, th their vaccines are safe. Uh, they do not have microchips embedded in them. Uh, but such misinformation did re uh, reduce the trust that people have on va in vaccines and did reduce uh, the, the uptake of vaccines. So we started studying online misinformation against of COVID-19 back in 2020. And we collected uh, in the initial study, 8 million tweets, but we have since expanded that to around 100 million tweets. Um, and what we found was that while people are spreading misinformation, people, some people are also countering misinformation. And in fact, 
96% of all counter messages are delivered by non-experts. This was surprising to us because uh, what we found was that while professional fact checkers and journalists uh, are creating fact checks, non-experts, ordinary users like you and me, we are the ones who are actually propagating these fact checks on, this, on social media. We are the ones who actually are engaging with misinformation spreaders and correcting them. This was a, a, a really an eye-opening uh, statistic for us. And we have created a, a very big line of research around that. My NSF career proposal is also uh, focused on that. And uh, we what we have uh, what we found in this particular work was that while almost all counter misinformation messages are by non-experts, most of these messages are in fact wrong in the sense that they are rude, they are calling people names, they are abusing them. And that's very risky because it has it can backfire in the sense that bad actors, uh, in the sense that misinformation believers would become even more uh, would, would 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 essentially uh, be forced to back their own positions and the, uh, it can backfire in the sense that people would not believe in the counter misinformation just because of the tone that they have. However, uh, this statistic uh, was very important. Uh, this work did influence Birdwatch, which is Twitter's, uh, Twitter now calls it uh, Community Notes, uh, and it's a community-based misinformation flagging system. And uh, since then, we have uh, created uh, uh, multiple different solutions. We have been working on multiple different solutions to empower ordinary users uh, to do better counter misinformation uh, efforts. This is one of the works. Uh, this is actually an upcoming paper uh, at uh, ACM Web Conference 2023, where we have created a counter response generation model. This is a real misinformation uh, tweet about COVID vaccine from Twitter. And this is a real reply. The misinformation is talking about, is, is claiming that COVID vaccines are gene therapy, it alters your DNA. And real and people have replied to it saying that you are you're born to speak nothing but lies. Our system, which uh, is a counter response generation, text generation model, so think of it as chat GPT, but for countering misinformation, uh, we, we made it much before uh, uh, chat GPT was released, by the way. Uh, what, we, uh, it, what we are able to do is to take uh, data, training data, uh, take real good replies, good counter replies, along with crowdsource replies and professional fact checkers replies. We are able to take that and create a counter reply, counter response generation model uh, that is factual, that's polite, and directly refutes misinformation claims that are there uh, in the in the original post. And this is a reply that our post makes. It says, "This is not true. It has uh, it has nothing to do with cloning or DNA. It only uses mRNA." And uh, there's more information that it provides. So my vision is that with such a system, will be we. Uh, can empower ordinary users to correct misinformation effectively and at scale and in real time. In addition, uh, we have a very big grant from NSF called uh, Convergence Accelerator, uh, where we are creating Course Correct, which is a tool that uh, enables professional fact checkers and journalists to monitor misinformation that's spreading on social media in real time. Uh, Srijan, we have a oh, sure. question on the bridge uh, from yeah. Julia. Uh, what is the basis for whether or not it is fake or true information? Am I missing something? This seems to track whether information conforms to a certain majority view. Isn't it possible majority could be wrong? Absolutely. Majority can be wrong. So that's why our work does not rely on, on, on uh, crowdsourcing alone. Uh, in fact, uh, our work relies on labels that are generated by professional fact checkers and journalists who are professionally trained to identify, uh, to dig 
into 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 any particular topic and tell us and give us labels so we are uh, part of ifcns or international fact checking networks uh, uh, database uh, we have access to that database where professional where international several international fact checking organizations i think it's uh, on the order of like 50 or more organizations uh, contribute fact checks that they create uh, this was an effort that was started during COVID-19. So we, our misinformation detection systems are based on data set uh, on, on fact checks that have been professionally generated. We take that information into account uh, to, to label misinformation tweets and to create misinformation classifiers from that. So we never, we, I, I'm not trained, none of my students are trained to be the arbiters of truth. Uh, we all, always rely on expert labels uh, that are there. Uh, that's also used uh, for our counter response generation as well. So we always we, we always rely on professional labels. Because as you correctly said, majority can be wrong or then can be manipulation where you know bad actors can create many accounts to uh, to essentially create the illusion that majority believes, uh, in the misinformation or, you know, that misinformation is not actually misinformation. So yes, that, that actually happens. Um, that is, that's quite common. We would call that a, a, a robustness or adversarial attack. Uh, and, and that's why we always rely on professional labels. Okay, thanks. All right. Uh, so continuing on, and I'll wrap up in a minute. Um, so as I was saying, we are developing Course Correct, funded by NSF, to empower professional fact checkers and journalists uh, to to not just see uh, which users are consuming misinformation and which users are, uh, are are frequent spreaders of misinformation, but in fact to deliver corrections to them uh, in real time via platforms ad uh, ad targeting systems. Uh, we are developing that. We have very positive response from uh, uh, from from our end users, and uh, we, uh, as I said, uh, we have an, a CDC grant where we are creating a dashboard for public health experts to monitor as well as intervene to counter the impact of violence provoking uh, dangerous misinformation. Uh, let me wrap up uh, before I do. I'd like to thank my students, postdocs, uh, and collaborators. So these are, this is my group uh, of postdocs and students. Uh, my work is funded by, by these agencies, very grateful uh, to them for the support that they provide. We also have uh, postdoc as well as data engineer positions in my group. So if anyone's uh, looking uh, for their next adventure, adventure in this space, please feel free to reach out. Let me wrap up. Uh, uh, I talked about uh, the work that my students and I have done uh, in the area of web uh, of platform safety and integrity uh, to uh, where we have created models to detect online harms such that the models are not only accurate but also robust uh, as well as I talked about some of the mitigation solutions that we have created. Uh, I've enjoyed answering questions uh, and I'll be happy to take more if there are any. Uh, and uh, thanks again for inviting me uh, to to speak uh, with you all today. Thank you, Professor, for such amazing uh, question. Very specific to corrected bot. Let me now some. Uh, I can't hear you. Sorry. Uh, am I audible now? I think it's probably with my mic. Yes. Um, okay, uh, so uh, uh, I, I was asking if the misinformation is uh, having some mathematical incorrection. For example, let's say uh, Queen Elizabeth ruled England for 300 years. We as a human know it's incorrect, but how does bot would firstly know that it's incorrect information? And secondly, um, if it knows, uh, the span of years is generally not found in information. So uh, a typical bot would need to, you know, evaluate the years of ruling, subtract it, and then give the answer. So how how this kind of uh, uh, cases are handled with corrected? Um, 
right now it's not uh, it's a it's a very difficult problem it requires so the current version of the the counter response generation model is uh, is is the first i would call like version 1 uh, future versions i envision would incorporate uh, knowledge coming from knowledge uh, from databases, knowledge graphs, uh, and scientific literature and news articles and so on. Right now, it's purely looking at language. It's purely looking at what others have done, what professional fact checkers and journalists would, uh, would how they would respond uh, to the content. Right now, detection systems and countering system, there are no countering systems, but detection systems, uh, and do not are, are not smart enough to to uh, to work with logical inconsistencies uh, or mathematical fallacies and so on so right now uh, the the that is an open challenge i would say if you are interested you know uh, would would love to hear uh, what you are able to do and uh, do on it uh, but uh, but definitely i think that's a that's a very difficult problem and something that uh that 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 definitely needs to be sought thank you so much professor uh hi Susan. there is a question on the bridge uh so tom asked uh great research and presentation dr kumar uh my question is who will vet the experts to ensure that they are not introducing their own biased misinformation good question uh we have thought about it not in the context of misinformation detection but in a similar uh, context of fake review detection where we 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 don't you know trust who is writing what we don't trust uh who is saying what so there we created a system called rev2 which stands for reviewing the reviewers uh, where the goal was to create a mathematical uh, a, a iterative algorithm that would uh, be able to use uh, uh, they'll be able to use consistencies to identify whether uh, someone's uh, whether someone is uh, is reliable or not so based on that one would give reliability scores uh, not just based on one piece of content that uh, that someone has written but based on the based on all the things that the, the uh, all the reviews that they have written so we are able to develop that we are able to deploy that on face uh, on on flipkart which is india's largest e-commerce platform but i would imagine that an extension of that or a version of that could be used for uh, for fact checking or misinformation uh, as well where we could use uh, a reliability score metric to identify or to rate these uh, professional organizations or experts to see whether uh, how reliable they themselves are right now we trust what they're doing because they are part of iscn which is a very reputed international organization and they have a very 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 strict criteria of uh, which organizations can become part of the iscn network uh, i know the people who who do uh, the vetting uh, they are very reputed uh, journalism professors. Uh, one of them is in Wisconsin, Madison, uh, and and so on. So uh, right now we trust the judgments that that these professional fact checkers and journalists are providing us. That's not to say that uh, that they might not be wrong, and they can be wrong because of uh, be because of uh, evolving scientific evidence, for example, right? Um, or uh, in cases where. Uh, the the scenario evolves or the truth evolves or uh, they have inc uh, incomplete information so these errors can be there uh, we are not uh, we are not uh, unaware of such issues right now uh, we do not uh, our systems assume that they are correct they are reliable uh, but future extensions of uh, of these systems can be created where uh, where uh, where the work can be used uh, to also take into account these uncertainties, these unreliabilities, uh, the evolving nature of information uh, or content itself, and of course, the reliability of those who are providing the labels. Great. Yeah. So another question from Prashant. Uh, exciting research, Professor Srijan. I was curious to know how frequently do we crawl web 
Reddit or Twitter to detect possible misinformation to be flagged in systems like Fact Checker. And if there is any SLA service level agreement between when it was posted and detected? Mm, good question. So right now our systems are not real time. Uh, the course correct system that we are building that we aim uh, to, to make it real time in the sense that uh, when a end user in which in our case, it's a professional fact checker um, logs into our system and they put in a query, we'll be able to go and fetch uh, misinformation on that topic for them. Right now, we are in the stages of building it, so we don't have the system ready yet. Um, we we do have a crawler for crawling mis, uh, COVID misinformation that we run real time. We have been running that for the for the past uh, two and a half years or three years now. Um, yeah, and uh, it's possible once the data is collected, it's trivial for us to detect misinformation on that because we have pre-trained misinformation classifiers on these topics. When new misinformation arises, we are able to uh, to retrain these classifiers to include new information as, as soon as it arrives. And um, I don't really understand what you mean by service level agreements. So I, 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 I yeah. Uh, if you can clarify that, I'll be happy to answer it. Yeah, sorry. Uh, sorry, thanks for clarification, Professor. It's just that we, as a term we used here in the company, uh, that the time until which it was actually posted, until which it was actually de detected. So any, mm -hmm. uh, basically, the time and seconds are ours. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. As I said, we don't have the real time system yet, so we can't. Uh, yeah, we we don't do this real time detection. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Thank you so much. And really exciting research. So thanks for your presentation. Thanks, Prashant. Um, I have a question. Um, so I was wondering how um, these uh, systems that you built for detecting uh, misinformation, um, how how would they adapt to new topics or new uh, misinformation that comes up? Great question. So that's actually a project that we have started just three weeks ago, where we are uh, trying to create generic misinformation classifiers uh, that can then be fine tuned when a uh, when when a uh, new misinformation topic arises with very very few labels so we are thinking of it in terms of few short learning uh, nlp models uh, in english language for now uh, english text um, and we are trying to create few short learning systems that can be used to identify to to update models as new new misinformation topic arises um, that's a very important area of research, I believe, because that's something that current systems lack. Currently, it takes us um, a couple of weeks to update our misinformation classifiers because it requires us to recrawl data, label data, label like thousands of data points, and then uh, create models. But of course, as you can imagine, that's not scalable. So that's why we are creating these few short learning techniques. Uh, very active area of research. I don't think there's any solution for that right now. Uh, so hopefully by the end of the semester, we'll have something exciting. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, okay, there is one other question in the chat. Uh, being uh, said in practice, any AI needs a huge volume data for training and working day to day. The contents of the websites are also updated frequently. I think the biggest workload for the AI system is training and monitoring the correctness uh, or of its results instead of the system design and implementation. How do you evaluate your AI system in the workloads? Uh, yes, information evolves new information comes in information is corrected uh, this real timeness is something that none no existing system is able to solve except for the fact that you can update uh, retrain your model from scratch ag again when new information or when when as as new information arrives uh, what we do on the other hand uh, is is that when something new happens that's related to what we have looked into before 
uh, we annotate a few more data points and use that as additional training data. That works, but it's not perfect. Uh, so that's why, as I was just uh, saying in, in, in response to the previous question, we are working on these few short learning models that a uh, few short learning misinformation detection models that uh, can be uh, that can be retrained or rather trained from scratch uh, for, uh, using only a few data points uh, okay thanks srijan uh, is there any other question any more question if not i think uh, yeah we past the 6.30 mark. Uh, thank you so much for uh, your wonderful talk. It was very uh, interesting. And uh, uh, the, uh, as you mentioned, uh, with chat GPT and DALI, the things are getting even more like uh, interesting, exciting, and also like, uh, uh, I'd say, uh, Maybe yeah. dangerous, scary, <laughs> a little bit. So yeah, let let let's see what we have in the future. Uh, thanks uh, again. Uh, yeah, with that, yeah, people are. I think it was such a great session. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, so yeah, I think we can end the talk here today. All right. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Thank you thanks for having me, and thanks for the questions. <laughs>